she dropped the kids off. Because you see Liz is building there, you got to be Some of the stuff is it's a four this class. Like months ago, like most of this is the other the beginning. I said, yeah, both of us do. I have, 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 Every time the words open, no matter who's speaking, I've seen you take notes. One of the main things I love about you. I do, but I don't know if I ever look at them again. <laughs> you know, I still do it. Uh, there are people who have preached on passages. I've taught and preached a dozen times, and I still take notes because it helps me retain it, and I want to hear what new thing the Spirit might reveal out of it. And I've got notes going back to 1990, my first year in the Lord. Focapuccio notebooks stuffed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot the hole punch. Do you want to get it? It's in the cabinet above where the fax machine used to be in the office. Do you know where that was? I think so. So the shelf right in front of you when you go in in one of those cabinets up top. It's a blue one. It's really heavy duty. Thank you. I forgot all about that again. All right. Well, we should, uh, we should get started because we've lost two weeks. And unfortunately, I can't add any weeks on to the end of this. Because uh, I'll be going away the Wednesday after we're supposed to be done. So at this point, we can't do it. So what I was planning on doing was we'll just keep moving along as best we can. I don't want to rush First and Second Corinthians or Romans. So we'll probably be another four weeks really before we're through with those books, which is all of what's next. So we got the three longest books in the New Testament. Um, what I do encourage you to do, though, is keep reading at the same pace you would have been if we didn't miss two weeks of class. So that way we can keep moving ahead and however much time we have each week, we'll just go as far as we can. These books, I think, First, Second Corinthians and Romans, we shouldn't rush through. And there's some others too that we're not going to be hurried as we go through. Oh, Warren has the hole punch over there. Yeah, that's the right one. So um, how about, can somebody pray to get us started off tonight, invite the Holy Spirit to do His thing tonight? which I know I need more than anybody. So um, let's pray and then we'll dive right into 1 Corinthians. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can come and gather together and learn more about you. We just thank you for your word and how it comes alive in us. And we just uh, thank you for these teaching on it, that we might absorb it and uh, learn more about you. We just thank you for your blessings each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. So, um, well, let, let's get into it uh, so that we can try to get caught up a little bit tonight, at least. I don't. We're not going to get past First Corinthians ten. I can guarantee that tonight. I kind of paced it out a little bit, and I don't want to hurry through some really important stuff on how to walk in love together. So, so tonight we're getting into First Corinthians. First, let's look at the backstory. So, if you have your outline for the Book of Acts, we're in Acts eighteen. As far as the storyline goes. Coming in on the end of Paul's second missionary journey, or we, we call it second, wait, what? Yeah, Paul's second journey going into his third. We call it second just because it's recorded in Acts, but as we say, I always put it in quotes because Paul's already been in ministry 25 years at this point. So it's by no stretch his only second or third time out there. So um, first we have, remember, Paul was in Corinth, and it says that in Sincre, he had his hair shaved because he took a vow. Did any of you look into that to try to figure out what that was all about? Yes, I wrote something down about Okay. No, it's all right. Do you have it? I don't know where I have it. Yet. Okay. So for that, just so that you know about studying the Bible, uh, Bible background commentaries are really helpful with things like that. Like what vow could that possibly have been? If you've read the Old Testament, there's one that stands out right away. Uh, Samson. Grew his hair long because he was, uh, does anybody remember? Nazarene, a Nazarite vow. So that was a vow of extreme holiness. No wine, you're given to fasting and prayer. It's a vow that really, if anybody knows you've taken it, which they will when your hair gets long, um, they'll know that you've really consecrated yourself to the Lord. So why would Paul take a Nazarene vow 
over here in Sankria on his way to Jerusalem. He ended up in Jerusalem. Why would he do that as he's going back into Jerusalem? What do you think? The Bible doesn't say, so we're just kind of speculating, trying to dive into the story a little bit because it's a detail that's not in there for nothing. Why would Paul do that? He got tired of his hair. It's around all these. Because, you know, the Greeks kept their hair cut real tight. You've seen, you know, depictions of ancient Greeks and Romans. They had a really tight haircut, so he would have stood out in the crowd for sure. I mean, Jesus always has long hair in the movies. That's got to be right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So, um, Paul's, in, Paul's going back to Jerusalem. What's that? He wanted the Jews to know that he still was with them or Jewish. Very good. Yeah, so last time he was in Jerusalem, and every time since he's been in Jerusalem, what are they accusing him of? What's their offense at Paul? He's creating a sect and not that goes against Moses. Yeah, he's he's destroying Moses and creating basically a new religion out of it. So he's he's there going, look, guys, I'm I'm going to honor you, and I'll honor our traditions. I'll even honor something out of the old covenant, just for the sake of loving you and not creating an offense. So just so you all know. I still worship the same God as Moses. Now, is Paul coming under the law? He wrote Galatians already by this point. You read that about circumcision and coming under the law. You know how he feels about that. But the answer to it really is in 1 Corinthians. We'll see it when we get to chapter, uh, what, chapter 9, when he says, to the Jew I became as a Jew. To those under the law I became as one under the law. All things to all men just for the sake of reaching him. So he's still, although Jerusalem wants to tear him limb from limb, which they'll try to do later on in Acts, Paul's heart is still toward Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He still wants to reach the Sanhedrin. He wants to reach his old Pharisee friends. He still has a heart for them, even though everywhere he goes, they're ready to destroy him. By now, we don't know. Before he wrote 2 Corinthians, Paul had been whipped and beaten a total of uh, eight times altogether between those two. The uh, 30, uh, 40 lashes minus one, as he describes it in 2 Corinthians, that's how the Jews punish lawbreakers. So Paul had already experienced that between three and five times. <laughs> so for him to go back to Jerusalem and act like one under the law, he would have taken that lock of hair that was shaved from his head and brought it to the temple, put it on the altar of sacrifice, and then made some sacrifices. So that's what Paul did. Did he do that so that he would have better fellowship with God? Absolutely not. He'd rail against that. He did it to open the door to the Jews and maintain a place where he could still minister to them uh, so that they wouldn't shut him out completely. So anyway, that's what that was all about. On his way back, he brought Priscilla and Aquila. Did you all notice that whenever that couple is named, it's always the woman named first? You had said that, and when I, I looked four or five different translations... And some of them kind of switch. It switches it around because the man always comes first in a patriarchal culture. Right. And it's not listed that way in the original Greek. Okay. It's Priscilla's name first. That was one of my questions. Yeah, and that's an indication by, you know, we still say Mr. and Mrs., right, at our weddings, Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so and that, and that's patriarchal tradition. So in that day and age, in the first century, writing to Greeks as a Hebrew, for him to name, for Luke to name Priscilla first was a statement. This woman had the lead role in that couple. Um, I don't want to, you know, she wore the pants in the family. It's not like that. But clearly she was the one who had an anointing. And as you'll see when you read, did you notice? All right, so Priscilla and Aquila are left behind at Ephesus. It's kind of like Paul's lead team. He probably already had in his heart, I'm coming back to this city. He didn't stay long there because he wanted to get into um, a force into the Portis's area and then on to Jerusalem. It says that he went up and greeted the church after he came to Caesarea. So that's how we know he went to Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is always, we're going up to Jerusalem, no matter whether you're north, south, east, or west, it's always up to Jerusalem. So he went up to greet the church there. But he left Aquila and Priscilla behind, ministered in the synagogue a time or two, and then he took off again, but left them behind. So it looks like Priscilla and Aquila are like an apostolic lead team, or they were going to set, set up house for him. Um, some believe they were a wealthy couple, and they had means, they knew how to make money. So they probably found a nice house, and they said, we'll get you established here, Paul. Whenever you're ready, you come on back. So, um, so that's what he did there, and then he traveled back to Judea. All right, any, anything you guys saw or any questions about that yeah. little section of Scripture there at the end of chapter 18? He said he must 
in the 21st verse, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will yeah. return to you, God willing. Why must he go to that feast? It doesn't say anything more about it afterwards. Yeah. Probably because he already had a word of the Lord. That's why he went, some believe it was the Passover or Pentecost. It was one of the big feasts. And he wanted to go to the temple, having fulfilled a Nazarite vow in front of the city when it was packed out. Uh, it's one of the things Jesus did. All the major events that you see in the Gospel of John happen at the feasts. That's when he did his stuff in Jerusalem, because all the Jews from around the world are there. So Paul would have timed his visit to Jerusalem by the word of the Lord, apparently, to be there when all the Jews from all around the world, who already knew him by name. This man is the most known Jew in the world right now. So in Jerusalem, in front of the whole worldwide, you know, the diaspora gathered together in Jerusalem, there's Paul making an end to his Nazarite vow, making the sacrifices, burning his hair on the altar, and doing that. So it was a timing thing. He had to get back for the feast because everybody was going to be there. So probably, it, there's no, uh, the must about it, if it was a Nazarite vow, he had a certain number of days before, you know, he had to do the thing with his hair. Normally you'd have it shaved in Jerusalem, but I don't know why he did it ahead. That so, was, um, that was a question I had was, was that Nazarene thing was 30 days till he made the sacrifice. <clears throat> so I was wondering, I didn't know how long it took by boat to get there. Yeah, well, with Paul, it could be anything because he got shipwrecked so often. <laughs> I ain't getting on a It'd be a three-hour tour with Paul any, any day of the week. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that's what it was about the feast. Uh, you see it in, in John, and I believe Paul did the same practice. I'm going to maximize the impact. I'm going to be there when all the Jews from all around the world are here celebrating one of the feasts. All right, so then... Uh, he goes there, he goes back home to Antioch, and then he sets out on his third journey where he walks again. This time he's probably got an entourage. By now, he's got like Timothy and Titus, some others that are named in, you know, in the book of Acts that, that are traveling with him now. Makes his way back through Galatia. So this will be his third visit to all these churches in Galatia, strengthening them. The first ones, you know, this guy's got this love, affection for them. The first ones he planted you know, in Christ, and then he makes his way back up to Ephesus, and he'll spend two years in Ephesus. He read the beginning of that. He comes in, finds those disciples that were only baptized with the baptism of John, were introduced to Apollos at the end of that chapter. Did you guys catch that? Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about Apollos, because you may have noticed he was named in 1 Corinthians. But from Alexandria, he was very learned. Mm -hmm. Later on in Corinthians, then... Some people just follow him rather than Paul. And yeah. Paul says, we're not following either one of us, we're following Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul, or Paul is a very bold, fervent preacher. Mm -hmm. He's you know, very outspoken. I mm -hmm. thought it was funny in verse 25. Uh, I have the Amplified, so I don't know what it <laughs> says. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things about Jesus. And then down in 26, it says... Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained more accurately to him the way of God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So because it says he was only acquainted with the baptism of John. So tell me what that's about. The baptism of John versus the baptism of Jesus. For repentance and preparation for the Messiah. Okay, so that's John's baptism. It's just about repentance. Yeah. Repent of your sins. You come out of the water and what happens the next day? Well, it's Jesus' baptism then. With John, you start over again. You're going to need to get baptized again in a few days because you got dirty again after you came out of the water. Jesus' baptism includes what? The Spirit. The, Spirit. the Holy Spirit, right? So when Paul came and he found the disciples, it says they were disciples, meaning disciples of Jesus, but they were only baptized into John's baptism. They hadn't gotten the Holy Spirit yet. This is a huge need. It, it, water baptism is about repentance. It's like the day of the Passover for the ancient Jew, right? We're coming out of slavery right now, but now we got you out of Egypt. Now we got to get Egypt out of you. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit's all about. Christ in us, making his way through and out of us. So, so that's what was going on there. And Paul took care of it, but um, Priscilla and Aquila helped him. And then it says that he wanted to go across to Achaia. That's where Corinth is. He had in his heart, he's a Greek, 
He said, hey, I heard there's a booming church over there. I'd love to go preach and teach. Priscilla and Aquila are like, yeah, that's great, man. We'll send letters and commend you. You're awesome. They'll love you over there. So he went over there and somehow found himself in the midst of a four-way split in the Corinthian church. Because he was a Greek, very eloquent, it says. So he spoke the way the Greeks like it. They like really good, eloquent. You know, you remember Paul in Athens, all these people out there pontificating. They love to hear the new idea. They love to hear, you know, just a lot of talk from the mind. So here comes Apollos, newly educated in the full gospel. A novice, really, when it comes to walking. And boy, did he create a mess when he got over there. You notice... When Paul in 1 Corinthians, he said, some say I follow Cephas, some say I follow Paul, some say I follow Apollos, some say I follow Christ. Go a little bit further on, and he's just naming Apollos. You know, I planted Apollos water. Mm -hmm. So it appears that Apollos really caused a split, probably unintentionally, because people are just like that. They like to gather around people. So, all right, so that's what happened in Ephesus. He spent, Paul spent two years there and really made it an apostolic center. It says all of Asia heard the word of the Lord because of Paul's two years there teaching in the house of Tyrannius. Um, it was a really strategic spot. It was the Roman capital of Asia Minor. So the entire region that's called Asia. In the service, this was the Roman capital, 350,000 people in it. And it was a major trade center right along the uh, trade route, which, which is called the Silk Road. Now, um, you know, the ancient Silk Road, so connecting the east to the west, a lot of wealthy merchants in this city, and a lot of idolaters, a lot of idol makers. They made a lot of money. The um, Temple of Artemis, or Diana, she was called by the Romans, was here, and it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That's uh, in the background, that's what it, that's an artist's rendition. It doesn't look like that anymore, but that's what it would have looked like in that day. Huge. Um, and uh, people would come from all around. Artemis was a warrior goddess. Um, she was the goddess of the hunt and warriors, and she was a virgin. It, it, she celebrated virginity, but they made the worship that you could sacrifice your virginity to Diana. So people came from all around the world to offer up their sacrifice of their virginity at the temple of Diana. It was like a really special thing for them to do. So that's the spirit that hovers over Ephesus. That's like if you want the principalities and powers, this is the primary principality over it. And just a, in terms of spiritual warfare, this is where I like stopping on this to take note of something. There are a lot of things we're learning about spiritual warfare, especially, you know, what we call making war in the heavenlies. A lot of stuff that we did in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even into the early 2000s, railing against, you know, principalities and powers, and we're going to take you down and all this kind of thing. Did you see Paul do any of that? in his ministry in Ephesus. And it really struck me. We were in the middle of having some people around in the church that were really given to that. Let's go pray and tear down principalities and open up heaven. And um, it's like, no, Paul didn't do that. But after two years of establishing the kingdom of heaven in there, it shook the principalities because they no longer had a foothold. What spiritual warfare is really about is displacing principalities and powers if they rule over an area the spiritual wickedness in high places right they're like governing authorities the only reason why they have any authority in a region is because they're worshiped in that region so how do you stop people from worshiping whatever principality is there you replace it with the kingdom of heaven and before you know it the foothold the strongholds are, are crumbling down and after two years finally this stronghold came down and it rebelled against Paul, and that's when we had the riot. But that's for next week or the week after, whenever we get there. All right, so that's what's going on in Corinth. Any questions about this part? We're breaking down Paul's third trip because he, two years in one place, you can never get the men to stay still that long until now. So this is a great day for the kingdom, man. They finally, I love to have the tapes. <laughs> Paul, two years every day teaching in a school. Man, that's a school of ministry. I'd pay everything I had to be in that school. So he was there, and, and that's why all of Asia heard the Word of God. So that's the biggest area now that Paul's reaching, and he's raising people up and sending people out. So it appears like an apostolic center that Paul established there, and that would be really, he'd call that home. You'll see when we get further on, when he comes back and he meets with the elders at Ephesus, you can feel his father's heart for them and a richness of relationship that he has with them. And Ephesus is going to become a major 
uh, strong church in the region. It comes up in the book of Revelation. John, for sure, had ministry here for a long time. Most believe that he brought Mary with him, Jesus' mother. He took care of her in her old age, and Mary was here in this church. So that's church history tradition that they ended up there. So Ephesus, major church center after this. From Ephesus, Paul gets word, either a letter or uh, some kind of a messenger from Corinth, from the house of Chloe. That's what I've heard from the house of Chloe, Paul says. So somebody from Corinth named Chloe, that is a woman's name. No matter what your translation does with that name, it's a woman's name. When a fr- the phrase is, I've heard from those of Chloe, that's a phrase which indicates she was a leader in the church. Very likely what we'd call a house church leader. When you say they're of somebody, like they're leading a group of people. She was either an elder, a pastor, some kind of overseer in the church of Corinth who hit the panic button and said, Paul, We're splitting at the seams here. We need your help. We need input from a spiritual father. So she wrote to him or sent messengers to him. And that's the impetus for writing this letter. While he's happily ministering in Ephesus, he finds out, remember Ephesus, or Corinth rather, he spent 18 months there. He laid down, he paid a price to establish that church in Corinth. And now he finds out it's splitting. So there's passion in this letter once again. So let's dive into the the first letter to the Corinthians. What do you think is the general feel of the book? What was your impression of it? Um, And I'd love to hear, by the way, out of, I've asked you just to help you really process and meditate on the word, to choose a memory verse out of each of the books that we read and actually memorize it, by the way, not just choose one. So if you want to share that, like what verse of the whole book, what's the one you think, man, that is the center, center message of this book. Or any, so answer any of those questions. Tell me what you thought of the book. Big picture. Follow the, follow the message, not the messenger. Ooh, that's good. That's good. That sums up the whole beginning of the book right there. What else? General feel of the book. How would you feel if you were in Corinth? And you got this letter. That's something else I'd love to hear. I mean, it's a really boring doctrinal book, right? Just going through all the teachings, basic things in Christ, right? There's no controversy going on or anything like that. (laughs) Like when when your father talks to you after... (laughs) Even though when your father starts to talk to you at night... You start feeling, I think I did something wrong. You know? yeah. and, it just, and, he, and he's, he's talking as a father. He's talking, you know, mm-hmm. you're my children. I, I love you. Yeah. But as I was reading that, I just kept picturing my father sitting me down and I was talking. It, it wouldn't take but a couple seconds till I realized. Uh-oh. Not, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. yeah. Yeah, I could say heavy. It seems like he's very heavy. He throws a lot of stuff. At least to us, it seems like it's a lot of stuff that's important. Is that, oh, do you do this? This is not it. This is. So mm-hmm. they probably needed it, but us reading it, it's like, wow, oh, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. And he's, he's nice about it in some ways, but he's very intense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I love this one part I wrote in my, uh, on the side of the margin where he said, like, don't make me come down there. <laughs> you know, it's kind of has that feel. Like, you want me to come gently or, you know, with a hammer? Don't make me stop this car, right? Yep. <laughs> That's right. You don't want me to pull over. It's like a sandwich. Like, he says, I'm always thanking God for you because of the good things. And then he says, okay, now, this is not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take long to dive in. And then at the end, he's like, well, you're in my prayers. I love you. And so it's like a Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great insight. Immorality is one of the biggest things we're out there. Yeah, yeah. Not surprising after remember the introduction I gave you. Corinth, there's a word for prostitute, mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was like that, and that, that's a hard stronghold to come out from under when you live in the midst of it. I mean, they worshipped sex literally. Mm-hmm. Well, 
One thing that's important to me, so this verse stood out um, in 1 10. It says, But I urge you, be believers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in full agreement mm. in what you say, and that there be no divisions or factions among you, but that you be perfectly united in your way of thinking and in your judgment about mm. matters of the faith. Amen. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one to really sum up the heart of the book. That, that's really Paul's heart in writing this letter. That's the entire, it's 16 chapters worth of Paul urging everyone just that way. Awesome. All right, let's go through. There's a lot of stuff. I love reading this book as a pastor because I think, man, I don't have any problems in the church compared to what they had. <laughs> you know, the stuff they were doing, getting drunk in the middle of the Lord's Supper, a dude, you know, who's sleeping with his mother, his stepmother, and the church is like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I feel like, man, I've never had to deal with anything like this. So it makes me feel good about the church when I read it. All right, so the breakdown of the book, the first six chapters read like, these are the problems that Chloe reported. Uh, I mean, all the whole book really is all the stuff that Chloe's saying, here's what's going on. But the first six, uh, six chapters, like Paul's really going after, here are the things I hear that are going on. You guys got to knock it off. Th this stuff is destroying the work of the kingdom of heaven in your midst right now and, may, and ruining the love atmosphere that we, we established in Christ. So um, the first one, really, the first four chapters are all about factions in the church following people rather than following Christ. So I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Tell me what you saw in chapter 1. What did you write down there about what you saw and what the Lord's doing? All I wrote down is, uh, to avoid sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. The chapter 1? Isn't that 1? Oh, you're moving ahead of us there. <laughs> yeah. That looks like a one, doesn't it? Seven, one. Yeah. You got handwriting like me, huh? I have. Why I wrote this down, I'm not sure, because I did this a while ago. Okay. The world is no match for God. So you're looking at man's wisdom versus heavenly wisdom, and yeah, that's that's a lot of what he starts getting into in this, yeah. yeah. My question was, again, who is Chloe, and who are her people? You know? Yeah, yeah, very likely, you know, it says in Acts that they, they, met, they met house to house, so... All the believers couldn't fit under any one roof, so they had two places where they met. Solomon's Colonnade, which is where the apostles would have been preaching, telling the stories of Jesus, preaching and teaching the things concerning the kingdom of heaven. And then they met house to house, which is probably where they broke bread and shared life together and ministered together. So Chloe likely was a leader of one of those groups, maybe that met right in her house. Or the, the word for Chloe's uh, house is oikos, and it simply means a, a community of people. So it can meet an actual house, but it usually refers to a group of people that live like family. So that's what Chloe was over. Well, they belonged to her the way it says it. So definitely a leader of some sort. We don't know what their titles were and how they went about it. Yeah, what I wrote down is the 18th. I'll read it out of here. It's a little easier to understand. <laughs> <laughs> For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Mm -hmm. That was one of the verses that children had to learn as a children's verse. Oh, yeah. And, uh, we were doing Bible study with them years mm -hmm. ago. And then uh, if you go on up to the, let's say the 27th, 27th verse, then it says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring nothing, the things that are, that no flesh may glory in his presence. Amen. That's how I knew I was called. <laughs> so that describes me to a T. Perfect. Weak, foolish. <laughs> I, I should verse 17 right before Warren. Well, mm -hmm. 
Oh, Christ yeah. did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's, and then my revelation and questions after that key verse, I said, glean from those that preach and teach, but do not put them on the same level as Jesus Christ. Always keep focused on Jesus. See Jesus through them. Learn from learn from Jesus through them. But remember, they are all they all point to Jesus. That's awesome. That's a great way of summing that up. Mm -hmm. And that's and that, that if if you have that mindset, then the factions aren't an issue. Mm -hmm. The divisions aren't an issue. Yeah. You know. Yep. Joyce Myers preaches differently than you do, but yet I can still receive from both of you mm -hmm. what Christ wants to say. To yeah. Me or to a situation. Mm -hmm. And that's. Amen. That's powerful. The, the truth is most people receive according to the grace that they carry. Mm -hmm. So if you're a, a prophetic person, if you're a prophet, you tend to really appreciate prophets when they minister and speak and teach or do whatever they do. If you're a teacher, you love things line upon line, precept on precept. You like things to be orderly in communication. If you're an evangelist, um, you know, you, you like people that are really all about reaching the lost and love and power and, and that kind of a message. Generally speaking, we're drawn to whatever we are. Mm -hmm. I, I love Christ in you because it reminds, you, reminds me of Christ in me. Mm -hmm. And the wisdom in this is, as you just said, you got to learn how to receive from all the tables. Mm -hmm. it, especially sometimes God will send the message through somebody who offends you. Like generally, this is a broad brushing it. Teachers and prophets don't usually blend well together because teachers are all about, no, that, that's, you got to be more accurate. That's not what it says down over here. And you just, you know, twisted the word on that. The prophet's all about, well, God spoke and look, power moved in the room. And, uh, you know, all right, so I misquoted scripture a little bit. What's the big deal? Um, so we, we just really need to learn how to do that. So it looks like what was going on here uh, in verse 12, he said, each of one of you is saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas, which is Peter's uh, name, and I of Christ. So uh, some people were following Paul and saying, he's the one I receive from. He's the one that I honor most. And so as you said, I can't receive. These other three don't really mean much to me. And then some were saying that uh, about Apollos, probably the Greeks. Hey, man, he speaks my language. Boy, when he, he is so eloquent, man, when he speaks, I could listen to him for hours. He just captures you with the way he shares the word. And then Cephas is there, probably was miracle working ministry. Hey, man, Cephas, man, his shadow heals people when he walks down the street. That kind of power. And the Jews probably liked him and say, yeah, that's our boy. All these other, you know, Paul changed his name to a Greek name. And, and there's Apollos, the Greek, but Cephas, he's Simon Peter. Jesus' right-hand man, and he's one of us. So they had this, and interestingly, some were saying, I am of Christ. And Paul lists that among the four factions in the church. What's that about? Isn't I'm of Christ the right group? Isn't that the one that would be, hey, you guys got it right. You just stuck with Christ. What do you think was going on there? We don't need to hear anything from... <laughs> it's just me and Jesus, man. <laughs> These leaders, forget that. I don't need them. I got Jesus, got the Holy Ghost. I'm having a Holy Ghost party all on my own. Yeah, and that's what a lot of folks do. This kind of, well, leadership, because they're fallible, because they mess up. I'm just pulling away, and I'm just do my own thing over here. And Paul said, no, no, don't do that. It's not just you and Christ. You can't honor Christ if you don't honor the body. There's no such thing. Christ is in the body of Christ. So you can't just go off and separate. So Christ hasn't been divided. Um, that's the, the message there. So interested, this is another thing that interested me. The Jews asked for signs and the Greeks searched for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Why did the Jews, why were they the ones that need the signs? They have a history of signs and wonders. They were born into God's you know, family. But they still didn't believe. By, they didn't believe even when the signs were there. Yeah, with daily manna, all that yeah. stuff, and, and they were always... Good enough. Yeah. It wasn't good enough. God yeah. was not good enough mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cra the craziest thing, but, you know, I remember reading that, going, wait a minute, now the Jews need signs. Why do the Jews need signs? I get the Greeks look after wisdom, right? They're like the Athenians, and they always want to hear stuff, but why do the Jews need signs? And it was exactly what they kept saying to Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jesus said to them, if you don't believe me, believe the signs. Yeah. 
believe it works. Mm -hmm. Didn't you say on Sunday that uh, those who don't believe are the ones that look for signs, and those that do believe are like, yeah, I can't do it. Like, they don't have to have them. Mm -hmm. It's just grace. Yeah. Because they already know the way. Yeah. So the Jews don't necessarily know that Jesus is the way yet, so they're still looking for those signs. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's his point. Move beyond needing signs. Just get into the wonders. <laughs> wow, I wonder what that's all about. Yeah. Um, all right, awesome. So chapter two then is, um, you know, I didn't come to you with speech or wisdom. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So what is Jesus crucified? What is that? Paul said that several times here in the first two chapters. His emphasis is not on the power of Christ, not on even the word of Christ, but the act of the cross. So what's that about after following through? I'm just trying to follow along with what the Spirit's communicating here. He chose the weak things. He chose the, you know, the foolish things to confound the wise. And so what I emphasized in front of you is the cross. Let me read that verse out of Oh, amplify. amplify it for us, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> for I made the decision to know nothing, that is, to forego philosophical or theological discussions regarding inconsequential things and opinions while among, while among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and the meaning of His redemptive substitutionary death and mm -hmm. His resurrection. Awesome. All right, so how does that, that goes dead set against all these other factions that the Corinthians were doing. We want the wisdom, we want to see the power. And Paul said, no, I'm going to give you the cross. I'm going to remind you that there's nothing, you know, that, that Jesus came in no shapely form or majesty that we should be drawn to him. So stop looking for that, because that's not where you're going to find the real deal Jesus. He comes in this common everyday package. And you keep looking for all this spectacular stuff, and you're going to miss how God works through everyday people. You're going to miss the everyday miracle of salvation, the everyday miracles that God wants to do along the way. Not to mention all the benefits of the cross. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm kind of jumping into this because I haven't read it, but... <laughs> do you think that like, he's hinting at like, the resurrection, too? Mm -hmm. Because he's saying... Um, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So if, if the Jews are asking for power mm -hmm. and the Greeks are asking for wisdom, and that he's saying, but we preach Christ crucified, mm -hmm. do you think that he's maybe hinting at the fact that like Christ was resurrected and that's how we know that he was both of those things together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That, and I think, you know, the path into the power of God and the wisdom of God is through picking up our own cross and following Him that way. Like, you're trying to get this the way the Greeks go after things. You know, all the Greek gods are these powerful, you know, conquering kind of things. So you have this mindset that you got to have something that looks great by man's ways. And that's how God shows up. But no, Jesus showed the ultimate power. Resurrection power was released when Christ was willing to divest himself of everything it meant to be God, took on the form of a servant, suffered death, even death of a cross. That's how he accessed resurrection power. And it's the same access point for us. It's through our own cross. I'm going to crucify everything that I used to think was great. Uh, you know, it's not just our sins and all that that were on the cross. All the things we used to brag about were also sacrificed in that cross. Come out on the other side with resurrection power, that that's the way we get it. Yeah. Good insight. Yeah, I'm jumping in there in the middle. I'm in numbers in my personal reading. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're never going to catch us. <laughs> yeah. But I'm getting a lot of it. <laughs> All right, so tell me more about chapter two. What did you see in that chapter? You need the mind of Christ in order to appraise things. You yeah. Know, we just don't have the wisdom on our own. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Verse 5 says, that faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, so like the things of the spiritual things have to be spiritually appraised. And it's a mistake that people still make to this day, even with the Bible. I'm going to discern what the Bible says using my natural mind. And you're never going to get it like that. 
you'll get a part of it, but you'll never treat it as anything but ancient literature. If the Word of God's going to come alive, we have to read it by the Spirit, and we have to appraise it by the Spirit. And there's certain things that just can't be understood. This is the reason why Jesus spoke in parables. It wasn't to make things understandable. These weren't like metaphors. That's what we always think. But when asked, Jesus said, I'm speaking so that seeing they will not see and hearing they won't comprehend. I'm speaking in parables so only spiritual-minded people will get the message that I'm preaching. Everybody else is going to be like, yeah, whatever, seed, thorns, okay. But a spiritual-minded person might, wow, that was life to me. What else? I remember yeah. years ago before I got saved, way, way back, I tried reading the Word, and, and the enemy, and when you're blinded and when you don't see, you see Jesus is arrogant. Oh, yeah. Jesus says, who yeah. does he think he is type mm-hmm. thing. But whenever I got saved and when the Holy Spirit came in and whenever he started teaching me, mm. it was revelation and the, my eyes were open. The understanding came. It was like, wow, this is awesome. Yeah. You, you have to have that. You have to have that relationship with Christ. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. It says, yeah. we're prescribed. It says, I, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm. We have to see ourselves as being on that cross. We yeah. have to crucify ourselves as a spirit. It's walk humbly before mm. God. Jesus humbled himself. Yeah. He humbled himself. And then mm. it says in verse 14, needs, we need spiritual discernment. Uh, verse 15, we are the judges. He is not he. If you look at, mm. at that verse, it says when we, when we have the spirit of God, we can judge things and discern things mm-hmm. rightly. Because it says in verse 15, it says, but he, that he is not capitalized. Mm-hmm. Right. That is us. Yes. But I, who is spiritual, ju- who is spiritual judges all things, yet mm-hmm. I, my, himself, myself, is rightly judged by no one. Mm-hmm. He's saying that when you have the spiritual, when we have that spiritual insight, we see things in a different level. And yet that's the things that we're going to be held accountable to, that that's why we must still f- maintain our focus on Christ. Because mm. it's through Him that we can judge and discern. That's awesome. And have that wisdom. Amen. And then verse 16 says, we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So we have, for who has known the mind of the Lord that He may instruct Him, but we have the mind of Christ. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's only through Him anyway. Anything we have is through Him. Amen. But Amen. we have to come to that place humbly mm-hmm. and say, Lord, teach me. That's really good. Amen. You know, and mm-hmm. do, I, do, we, do we all... It's yeah. pride. Pride and arrogance is what is what the Greeks and what the Jews were looking at in mm-hmm. what I can do and yeah. what I can do in the flesh and what I can do in the mind. But when you humble yourself and you ask the Lord to teach you, it brings that spirit of humility. It brings that place of understanding. It brings that place of, of discernment and wisdom and knowledge in, mm. in all things in the spirit. And, and, so, Amen. and you can't explain that to somebody who doesn't understand it. Yeah. And yeah. Amen. I'm dealing with it. <laughs> Amen. It's, it's a reality today, and we're not necessarily Jews or Greeks, but it's the same idea. It mm-hmm. is. It, yeah. It's not the label of the of the title of Jew or Greek. It's a, it's it's God giving wisdom on how to handle this and how to speak to this person. You know, help me have the discernment to know when to to preach salvation and when to be quiet, and all of that. And it's only through Him that we can do, go there. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's good. Even now, I mean, we, we can get caught up in the intellect. I don't know if you've ever tried to do this, but sometimes I try to rationalize in my mind the sense of the cross. Like how, you know, God who's eternal, how well, he knew he was going to rise from the dead. So what was the point? And, and in my mind, you can really get caught up. And I remember some of these confusing arguments, but the cross, Jesus chose the cross. Jesus, the Jesus I know, chose the cross. It's like that's the answer to every question, but the cross. Mm-hmm. You, you can't argue with the love of God. You can't argue with the passion of Jesus or even, you know, all of what was released because of the cross. It's the ultimate reset button for all things. And in either, uh, he's a nut job. Like there's that book, Liar, Lunatic, or Lord. I think C.S. Lewis made that point. Mm-hmm. And you have to. It's the, you got to answer that question. He was a total nut job who, you know, sad sack martyr, who was crazy, and he lied to everybody, 
about who he was, saying he was Messiah, Son of God, and all that, or he's the Lord, and that's his way, the way of the cross. That's the way to access all of who he is right now, is through that. And what blows my mind is that decision was made before the creation of the world. (laughs) Yeah. He knew this is something he decided before that. It's like God is so big that we can't comprehend that. I get that to some degree, and then you you just get your mind just is blown. It's like you know you can't focus on that all the time. Mm -hmm. Amen. That was a decision he made that he loved us that much. Amen. I have a question, but I didn't look it up in any other translations. It's in the seventh verse there. It says, We speak the wisdom of God in mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. <laughs> yeah. Our glory. Why yeah. is it our glory when we give Him the glory? Is it because He gives it to us to give back to Him? Is that what the... No, He crowned us with glory to rule over all the works of His hands. And He intends us to be glorious. There is a humble aspect of, yeah, it's to God be all the glory and all of that. But um, He wants us to rule and reign. He wants us to be glorious. The sons and daughters of a king are glorious people. And He intends us for glory. That's, you know, we're, we're destined for glory. And it's, it's true in, in the sense of humility we all get it. We know that in and of ourselves, except that we're born again, except the life of God comes and takes us on, that we have nothing in ourselves. But on the other hand, the Father wants us to be glorious. He crowned us with glory. And that's, you know, it's a perfect picture. So when you put a crown on a king, it doesn't matter what that king looks like. He could be eight years old, like Josiah, and be made king. It doesn't matter. As soon as that crown's on his head, that's the king. He is now glorious in terms of magnificent, majestic. And the Father wants His kids to be glorious and beautiful because He is. That's one of those thoughts you can't get your mind around. It's like it yeah. says give Him glory. So if you're going to give it to Him, you Yeah, have you got to have it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I remember uh, it happened here on a Sunday morning. We were singing that. It's an old song now. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. And that concept comes from Revelation where the elders are there and they throw their crowns down on the throne. And it's been written in hymns. It's been sung. And we've kind of got this mindset that he only gives us a crown so that we could give it back to him. And I remember we were singing that song and I was on my face weeping. And all of a sudden the Lord said, I don't want it back. I was like, whoa. Okay. I didn't give that to you. I don't need a crown. <laughs> you know, I don't need it back. I'm not an Indian giver. I, don't, I didn't give that to you so that you'd have something for me. I have everything I need. I want you to be awesome. I want you to glorify me by being glorious. Like, and, and that day I got up, I prophesied, and then I prayed the prayer. I said, Father, glorify your sons, that your sons might glorify you. That's what Jesus prayed, and I believe it's our prayer. Make us glorious so the world will see what you look like especially when they know they're not many wise, they're not many glory, they're not many in and of themselves that he chose. He chose the weak things so that he, everybody would say, what's that? The reward for his suffering. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, chapter three. This is getting into local church governing and love relationships in the church. What did you see there? All right, so nobody can lay a foundation in anything except what was laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of all things. So let's chew on that a little bit. He said, no other foundation but the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Not the doctrine of Jesus Christ, not the teaching of Jesus Christ, not those who believe in Jesus Christ, but the foundations laid in Jesus Christ. So what does that speak to? That maybe all our doctrines aren't necessarily, we shouldn't bank on our doctrines. Yep. Yeah, good. Don't replace Jesus with doctrine. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Man, that'll solve about 3,000 church splits. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right there. 10,000 denominations or something Mm -hmm. today. and discord among you are you not unspiritual Mm. and are you not walking like ordinary men unchanged by faith yeah 
like again. Yeah. Same message. Mm-hmm. You are not an ordinary man. I love it. Bill Johnson preached a great word out of this. He said, you know, the excuse we say, well, you know, I'm only human. No, you're not. You used to be. Not anymore. You're a son of God now. You're a daughter of God. You're not merely man. What verse did you just read? Three. Three. A foundation in Jesus Christ means that He's got a living, dynamic presence in and among the saints. He's not a as we say, a static, you know, we, we just have to learn some things. He's living, he's alive and breathing in our midst. So a foundation in a church, although teaching is important, there's a foundation in terms of how we do things. When we say a foundation in Christ, it's not just learning like the first principles of the doctrine of Christ. That's not just what it's about. It's about that everything you can say, Jesus' fingerprints are all over this thing, that his living presence was with us. As we did it, we co-labored with him as we added that ministry or as we made those disciples and matured these saints in Christ, that Jesus is involved in every little bit of it, that there's nothing that's built in the kingdom of heaven, nothing built in a local church that we could ever say we did that without Jesus' involvement. Like, I don't know how I've probably discipled a couple hundred people in my lifetime. To this day, there's no way that I would ever just pick up a book and walk with somebody without saying, Jesus, we need you right now to continue your miracle work of transforming the heart. No matter how many times you've taught first principles and the basics of baptism in the Spirit and all these kind of things, there's never a time that there's a substitute for the living presence of Jesus right now. And that's what Paul's getting at. You can't, you can't just keep teaching things because you learned them before. You still need Jesus involved in everything or you're not building on Christ. That's, that's how you build a house in the sand. Um, you can't so. live off the old manna. What's that? You can't live off the old manna. Nope. That's right. My wife Amen. Had this question from verse 17. It says, If anyone destroys the temple of God, corrupting mm. it with false doctrine, God, God will destroy the destroyer, for the temple of God is holy, sacred, and that is what you are. And she just asked about like present day churches that are still teaching law and still teaching <laughs> it's like yeah. where do that where does that stand with that verse it's like that's pretty tough that is that's a hard that's one of those hard sayings of the new testament yeah because the temple obviously is what us. us right so corrupting the temple means to lead the temple into sin or to get in the way of christ's work in somebody and so a teacher or a leader or somebody anybody really I mean, what was Jesus' harshest words toward people? Toward the Pharisees and the leaders of the Jews. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, he went on mafia when he said, if anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, mm-hmm. man, you'd rather the mafia get a hold of you, give you some cement shoes and throw you into the river mm-hmm. than, to, than to have to face me mm-hmm. if you do that. So that's Jesus. That's love incarnate. And that's how passionate God is about not leading people astray back into sin after they've been made holy and draw them away from fellowship with God. And that's what I think that's about. That's why it's so strong like that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to claim to be the judge of the living and the dead and to know, you know, who is responsible for that. But I sure would plead with somebody who's inserting sin. Like, you know, the Methodist church just had a vote about whether they're going to accept homosexual ordination. Apparently they rejected it, which was good news for them. But, you know, for those who teach that and say, we're going to accept this sin Mm -hmm. in Christ, I I don't want to be behind them on that day. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, when we're waiting online at the White Throne, whatever that means, I don't want to be there for that because that's you're leading people, confusing them and leading people into sin and away from the Lord with that. Stumble, not only the little ones to stumble, but cause whole congregations to stumble. A lot of Catholics yeah. are really, you know, absolutely. Because how they, mm-hmm. they revered their priest, you know, the priest could make them go wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, just that whole teaching alone. Yeah. yeah. You know, a priest as an intermediary between me and Christ, yeah. 
How how'd you reestablish that after? I mean, it's over a year. How you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how Jesus will judge all that and, you know, what that means and all. But I know if I face it, I'm going to be passionate about that. Dude, stop. Don't do that. Don't teach that. Don't tell people that. Um, Years back when we were going through a church situation, one of the prophetic words at the time was that the foundation of the church had to change. And, oh, yeah. Uh, well, that's when a lot of us began to say, wait a minute, you know, there's nothing wrong with our foundation. Our foundation is Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, yeah. Caused a little bit of a disturbance yeah. among some of us. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. All right, so um, anything else about chapter three that you saw? You want to share questions? It's just that I, you know, somebody lays the foundation, you know, then another builds upon it. And, and then the building is tested by fire, you know. And so we need mm. to, you know, uh, again, uh, realize that we work together. It's not done by one person. Amen. And that the body ministry, is all, you all need to be in one mind. And, uh, mm -hmm. Versus we read earlier about being of one mind and one spirit. And, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, building on that foundation of Christ. Amen. Excellent. Okay, so uh, chapter four, uh, 4, Paul really dives in about his relationship now with Corinth, which apparently was being tested. Um, we just heard Paul say, hey, why do you say that you're of Paul, you're of Cephas, you're of Apollos? But here Paul's making a point, really presenting himself to them as their primary ministry in Christ. So what's that all about? What did you see in this? And there's the issue of him calling himself father. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to... I want to get the idea that they're father, you know. That's, yeah. So um, do you want to just dive right into that question? Verse 15, if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. But what about when Jesus said right in front of the Pharisees in Matthew 23, call no man father. Yeah. So... We have Paul doing it, I'm your father. We have John doing it, saying, I write to you, dear little children. So what's the balance here? We have an apparent contradiction in the Bible. So what's the balance? What's the Lord speaking and what's the First fullness of it? They're actually calling him father. That's, that was about, that's Jesus said, call no man your father. Mm -hmm. He's fathering them. He's guiding them as a father would with children. Yeah, but he says, I became your father through the gospel. So I am your father. Says, Who's your daddy? Says, be imitators of me. Yeah, and so therefore be imitators of me. Yeah. It's a spiritual no, father, more or less. Mm -hmm. It's almost like he's putting himself above Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the question. Is he, or what, what's the balance? What can we understand about this? Some of it may be just, what do the Pharisees mean by father? There's a, did any of you dive into that or look into it at all? Have you ever? Is, is the father figure somewhat like the apostle, like the apostolic ministry, the five-fold ministry, the five-fold, you know, ministry? Mm -hmm. It's the anointed that are called to teach and lead. Mm -hmm. And they have a greater accountability, greater anointing to that. Yeah, there's some of that. I mean, father is a relational term. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Does it say anything about um, like an apprenticeship? Like if, if, they're, if the Jews had to learning a trade. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what the father is talking about? Well, that would be like when, his, when he says, if you were to have countless tutors, okay. the word there in the Greek is a, a boy tutor. Somebody, they were hired help for a wealthy home to teach, like you'd, have, you'd hire an instructor to train your children, to teach them the trade of the family, to teach them to write and read and so on. And Paul's point is, look, you can have a ton of those, but there's only one person. In Christ Jesus, I begat you, he said. So I had, I had something to do with your being born again into Christ. So I have a unique kind of relationship with you 
and no matter how many others come to minister, there's something unique that God did in connecting our hearts with one another. And that's what he's really going after with this. We have a relational tie. I'm not just anybody to you. I, I sacrificed for you. I paid a price and God anointed me. And that's the reason why you're in Christ is because I came to you. I mean, it's a bold statement and it can come across arrogant if we don't, if we're not careful and don't know Paul and understand what he means by the term father. And what John means by father when he used the term that John was right there when Jesus said that call no man father. The Pharisees used father the same way the Roman Catholic priests began to use the term father, which is look to me as your guide so that you can walk with God. So you need me. I'm a replacement almost for the heavenly father. You look to me. I'm the voice of authority in your life. You'll need to do what I say. And it's as a replacement. That's what the Pharisees did with their disciples that they would raise up. Look to me. I will instruct you in how to walk with God. Is that how Paul walked with the church? No. I mean, you saw how he was with the Galatians. He's always saying, look, look to Jesus. You don't need anybody else to teach you this stuff. You already know who he is. You, you have an anointing. You, you know this stuff. So when he says father, he's not writing as one who's saying, look to me as a replacement for the heavenly father. That's what the Pharisees were doing. Paul's point is we have a relational tie and God did something. God established us together. In 2 Corinthians, he'll put it like this. He'll say, it's the love of God that compels us to be connected, that compels you toward me. We have a relationship. Don't let the enemy get in the middle of that relationship because I'm always for you as one who will sacrifice. And in 2 Corinthians, he spends a whole chapter talking about, here's all of what I did just to get to you with the gospel. That's my credentials. That's why I deserve to have a unique place in your heart. Hey, let Apollos water the seed. Let Cephas come and work miracles, but you can't replace the relationship that we have. That's really his passion and heart. Did you find a verse? In, verse 21. I love how you're smirking with what you just read. It's like, wait till daddy comes home. Oh, the end of it, yeah. <laughs> Shall I come with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't make me come down there. 16 yeah. says to follow the example that I lived before you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's it. I mean, Paul, for sure, he wasn't somebody standing around micromanaging people's lives, as many who claim to be fathers do. A father in the Lord is just like a natural father. I remember this revelation hit me when I was holding my firstborn son. I was meditating and learning because I was a really rebellious young man, and I even got fired. The only job I got fired from was at a church camp. I got fired because I hated the director, I saw his faults, and I exposed those faults. I was like that. <laughs> so God was really dealing with me when I met Phil Capuccio. Some of you know I call him father. I call him spiritual father in my life. He doesn't lord it over me, and I don't look to him instead of Jesus. But he's got a unique place in my life that I wouldn't know what to do without. And I thank God for the gift of a spiritual father like that, who can explore any aspect of my life, and I'll open my heart to him any day. And I trust his counsel, his word toward me comes from a man who loves me. And that love has been proven over a 19 year relationship. Oh, sorry, 29 year relationship. So um, I was holding my son and I just finished changing his diaper and feeding him. And he spat up on me and I got poop on my hand when I changed his diaper. And I'm up three or four times at night with him and I'm sacrificing my life. Um, you know, going to sleep, bleary eyed on three hours, going to work rather on three hours of sleep. And it occurred to me that our introduction to authority is with the people that sacrifice the most for us. Parents, there's nobody who sacrifices more for a human being than a mother or father does for their children. And that's our introduction to authority. Those who serve. It's the most intense slavery that there is. But the most demanding boss that you'll ever have is a newborn baby all the way up through however old. And that's our introduction to authority. That's the heart of a father. I'm not here to lord over you. I'm here to lay down my life for you and sacrifice for you. I will always have as a motive whatever's going to be best to build you up into the most glorious you you could ever become. I wouldn't ever follow anybody or consider anybody a father that didn't have that attitude toward me. And that's what a true spiritual father is. That's what Paul was for sure. 
Any questions or anything else about that? I got to be careful because that's a subject I'm really passionate about. Relationships, relational leadership in the body of Christ. That's the only way that he ever does it. All right. Now let's get into the fun stuff. Chapter five, issue number two. Uh, sinful, childish behavior that was being tolerated by the church. Chapter 5, sexual immorality. What did you think about that? Verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Don't even associate with a so-called brother. I was like, did he read chapter 13 yet? (laughs) Maybe he didn't get that revelation until he was writing it. So what's that all about? What do you believe is the heart behind that? Verses tell you that the uh, do you not know your glorying is not good? Do you not know that the little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Mm-hmm. Therefore, purge or clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. That practically answers that question. Yeah, it really does. It does. So, what it sounds harsh. I mean, deliver him over to Satan. Mm-hmm. I think that um, the way it was explained ago uh, in California <laughs> that you know, delivering someone over to Satan is to in essence put them out of fellowship so that they um, desire they miss the fellowship and the desire to change mm-hmm. them back yeah that's the hope <laughs> with it yeah Let's keep exploring this a little bit. Because yeah, in verse five it does say, uh, uh, "Nature may be destroyed, and his sp- and his spirit be saved on the day of the Lord." Mm-hmm. I mean, so Paul's still hoping there's hope for this guy. Mm-hmm. Get him out of the church, but you know, still hope he turns around. Yeah. Spoiler alert: Second Corinthians tells us the end of the story, and it turns out well. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, this is this is one of those passages that. You almost want to skip over because it sounds so harsh, but it's really important so that we can be real in the body and not be, you know, there's two extremes. There's a Pharisaic, judgmental, condemning spirit. And then there's what we call greasy grace where anything goes and don't worry, it's all about love now. And somewhere dead smack in the middle of that's where Jesus lives and where his body needs to live. So how do we, this is the question of how do we deal with open rebellious sin in the midst of the fellowship of the saints? And Jesus gave us an answer already. It was the only line-by-line teaching that Jesus did with his disciples on how to deal with an issue. Matthew 18. So I guess the assumption is that whoever this is, whether, you know, Paul said you guys are celebrating it, but in terms of what we call church discipline, which isn't a term I really care for, this is the process of reconciliation. You first go one-on-one and see if you could win your brother over. If he won't hear you, and this is somebody who's in rebellious sin, not everybody has sin, right? Okay, just make sure we're all on the same page with that. Because John said, if you say you don't have any sin, you're a liar. The truth isn't in you. So we got that. So if he won't listen to you, take two or three more. So in the mouths of two or three witnesses, the word will be established. So hope that you can win him over with two or three more. If two or three can't appeal for this person to stop in their overt rebellious sin against God, tell it to the church. So the whole church is going to gather around, not in a spirit of stone the adulterer, but in a spirit of we want you to stay inside of us. We are having common union with Jesus Christ. And your behavior right now is anything but Jesus Christ. And we love you too much to let this issue come between us. We're appealing to you. Come close to the Lord Jesus Christ and let him clean you of that thing. Let him set you free of that thing. It's bothering. Uh, We can sense it in the fellowship. It's disrupting our communion with Jesus. And we love you too much. And if the person still won't hear it, then Jesus said, what? Do you remember the end of it? How do we treat him? Stone him! Like a tax collector or a sinner. How do we treat tax collectors and sinners? Jesus made one of them a disciple, right? We treat him with love, but are they now, are they still part of the community who's genuinely for real in fellowship with Jesus Christ? No. They're not, right? If you're still in shake your fist at God rebellion, after all of that process of trying to appeal and reconcile you to Christ, all the church is doing at that point is acknowledging you want to separate yourself from Jesus Christ. 
And we're honoring that. We're acknowledging that you've separated yourself by staying in this stubborn rebellion. So we release you from the fellowship. And we're going to call a spade a spade. You're not walking with the Lord right now. So we can't consider you when he says, uh, you know, don't associate with any so-called brother. It's not, a, not just a sarcastic phrase. This is somebody who's chosen. I don't want to be in the family of God. I'm going to live my way outside. So it's not for, this is not for like bondage. This isn't for the, the everyday sin that we're struggling with, right? Like Romans 7, the thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing. This isn't for that. This is for rebellious. I don't care what God says. I'm going to live my way. They really like, they're like the prodigal son. Really, they're choosing themselves to separate themselves. And it's yeah. like the father didn't say, don't go. It's like, yeah, you have a free will. You, yeah. yeah, you're not in a prison here in this. Yeah. I can't even, like, I can't see somebody in that state even wanting to stay inside the building church. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, uh, that's really good that you said it like that, because that was their problem. The church was celebrating it, not confronting it. Mm-hmm. So they had, for whatever reason, they'd made a peace with this guy having open sexual relations with his stepmother. And the church wasn't doing the Matthew 18 thing. It was accepting that. And that's where Paul got alarmed. That's where a little leaven, leaven's a whole lump. If you allow that and you condone that, uh, the homosexual issue right now, It's not that people are homosexuals that's the problem. Everybody has different sexual struggles, you know, if that's a sin issue in your life. It's when you condone it, when you accept it now as not sinful. That's a problem. Now you got some leaven that's going to, it's going to affect more than just that particular issue. You're now, you know, creating an atmosphere that's going to be really difficult for the spirit of holiness, impossible for the spirit of holiness to grow and develop when you accept it. So that's what that's about. It's a harsh passage and a lot of people get really confused and stumble over it because of that. And it's a necessary thing. A lot of people just kind of put that all to the side and allow people in open rebellion, known open rebellion, like known adultery in the church to stay in that without going after it. This is dealing with a brother or a sister. Not dealing with someone who's not in your congregation, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Dealing with family. And that's the hard part. That's where it becomes difficult because. Yeah. So at the end of Matthew 18, when Jesus finished that, he said, he goes in and he says, So whatever you bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. And that's one of those things, again, that kind of got got away from us as some teaching went out that was a little bit inaccurate about binding and loosing that that has to do with spiritual warfare. Jesus wasn't talking about spiritual warfare. Those were terms used by rabbis in that day to bind something means we're forbidding it. We are not permitting that to happen here. So if we say we bind that in the name of Jesus, we've sought God's heart and we're saying that practice is forbidden here. We're not going to connect with that. That's not part of the communion of, of Christ. When we lose something, uh, the translation is not very good. To lose something means I'm going to attach myself to that. So we are connected to that. We're going to allow the life flow of that to be part of our community among the saints. That's the actual meaning of those terms as they were used. So at the end of it, when the church comes together and says, this is open sin and we're, we're pleading with you to repent. If you refuse to do that, we're not attached to that. We can't, we're not going to connect ourselves in the spirit of fellowship to that. Now we're going to start reaching you as though you're lost. Because right now you're in rebellion against God. We love you, but we can't attach ourselves to that spirit. So that's the heart behind it. Does that make sense? Yes. I think the sticky look at today is beautiful correctness. Yeah. Oh, I mean, even in a church we're afraid to... Right. And yeah. Church, it's not love. To, yeah, you know. Right. And you're intolerant. against anything yeah and yeah so it's a challenge today to uh to be to stand firm in the word yeah and be faithful to the word it really can be and i'm sure like with the methodists now those that are saying wait a minute this is we cannot tolerate <laughs> homosexuals in the church we can't ordain them anymore we can't marry them you know mm-hmm. uh, because they've been doing that oh yeah and, uh, 
right now rebelliously been doing that, yeah. But, so, but they'll have a split for sure. Yeah, so I thought, you know, I was delighted to see that there was some, still some backbone in the Methodist Church. You know, it's because of the foreign element. It's the African Methodist Church. Yeah. That's, uh, the Methodist Church overseas is growing exponentially. But if you go into an African Methodist Church, you think you just stepped into a Pentecostal church. Yeah. They don't meet like American Methodists. They are on fire. I mean, I wish they'd get out of the denomination, stop wearing collars and whatnot, but they're on fire for the Lord preaching the word. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we stayed at a Methodist camp when we first went to Liberia. That dude was on fire. I thought, man, I let you preach in my church. You're like a Pentecostal, black Pentecostal preacher. And uh, it was powerful. Yeah. So they're the ones, they prevailed in that. But they did it in exactly this spirit. We are not attaching ourselves to that doctrine that false doctrine that homosexuality is no longer a sin. So you can separate yourself from us, but we're not going to attach ourselves to that. We're, we're forbidding that. We're, we're binding that. So, um, all right, so that's sexual immorality. Uh, then we had lawsuits among the brethren. That was interesting. What did you think about Paul's counsel on that matter? Did you notice the lawsuits come after homo over the sexual immorality? Just yeah, it's well, probably yeah. with the Methodist Church. Do you not think that they? Oh, they're going, they're going to. to be suing oh yeah, they'll be suing over property and, and like this yeah. Whole, you know, yeah. Greed and money and everything. Definitely will money. be. There's a, a ministry called Peacemaker Ministries. Ken Sandy is a former, he's an attorney, and he founded this ministry in the '80s. And he does an annual study on how much money is spent between Christians in lawsuits. So either church split lawsuits or believers suing one another in business practice. And the last time I looked, it was between, it's a hard number to peg, be, just in the United States, between 20 and $40 billion a year with Christians involved on both sides of the lawsuit. Wow, wow, wow. That includes divorces, all, all that kind of stuff. Okay. 20 to $40 billion. So what's the simple counsel of the Lord in this? It's, it's really two things. First of all, how can we address issues that might go to court? How should we address it? Matthew 18. <laughs> <laughs> that. Yeah, but how do you, like Matthew 18 is if there's obvious sin. In this matter, if you, if you got a court, it means you don't know who's right. Right? I mean, that's a civil, a civil lawsuit is, I think you wronged me. No, I didn't. And we'll let the judge or jury decide. So what's the, how should the body of Christ deal with those kind of issues when they this come up? one where if you, if you give them, if you, Walk a mile in his shoes, walk the second mile, and your coat <laughs> yeah. as well. And that verse, is that where this applies? Well, that's, that's the counsel of if you, even if you can't get it resolved. Yeah. Um, Don't take stand. it to the world system to judge, but mm -hmm. uh, seek God's wisdom in the, inside the body. Yeah. Aren't there any wise people in the church? I mean, I know he just said there aren't many wise that when they were called, but we have God's wisdom now. So yeah, get two or three people in the church who are dispassionate, they're not connected to the issue, let them hear it out. Agree before you go in. I'm going to submit myself to the leadership, to the wisdom, because I'm part of a body and I don't want let there to become a fissure or a, f a fraction in the body. So I'm going to submit myself to whatever you guys decide. We're going to present our evidence just like we would in a court, but we're not going to go before a pagan judge and prove to the world those Christians, see, they're hypocrites. They can't even get along with each other, and they're telling us all about love? Come on. Yeah. We're, supposed, we're going to be judging the world, and we're also judging angels. So if we, if yeah. we have enough wisdom to be able to judge really? liars, how are we going to do that? Yeah, whose cow is that? You can't, you're going to tell angels, and you can't even decide whose cow it is? Who are you going to say, Brianna? Well, I was going to say, like, if you follow that logic, I could see how somebody might say, like, that Christians should stay out of politics. Like, and that, I think, is maybe digging it too far. Yeah. I don't know where to draw the line then. Well, this would be, the, the issue is two Christians suing each other in court. That's what this one is. So politics, you got to be able to, you're dealing with the world. I, th I don't think that's what this is addressing. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, in government, you're dealing with the law of the land, changing it, enforcing it or whatever. And that's, I think, a different issue. This would be like, say, a husband and wife are getting divorced and they're suing each other. Look, you should have been before your church leadership about this already anyway. 
if you have and they agree, yeah, you guys should get divorced and do it amicably and let them help you divide out, you know, whatever you'd normally go to court for. That's belief. what this is about. It really speaks to a, a really solid, strong body of believers because to, mm -hmm. to submit yourself to other believers in that kind of a situation, you have to have a lot of love and trust. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's a rare thing. I've done it twice in 12 years here. Uh, both of them had to do with business relationships, and um, they both were, they got resolved well. I drew in a couple of other, actually, they weren't even elders. They were just a couple of businessmen in the church who were wise and dispassionate about it, and it ended well. They, they agreed to disagree. They couldn't work together anymore, but they didn't end up going to a lawsuit about it, and that was, that was phenomenal. So it does happen. It's rare. But then, so what's this counsel then? All right, let's say you can't get it resolved. What do you do? Don't defraud one another. <laughs> yeah, let's not cheat one another. But even if you are cheated, what does he say? I'll give you a hint. It's at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. You were just going there with it. He calls down fire on him. Calls down fire on him? <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> In love, I'll call down fire on you. No. <laughs> yeah. He says it. Look, why not let yourself be wronged? Let yourself be defrauded. That is better than giving a bad testimony and example to the world. Somebody compels you to go one mile, go with them two. Someone sues you. Jesus said, somebody sues you for your tunic or for your cloak, give me your tunic too. Give them more than what they're... They're taken from you. They can't rob you if you give it freely, right? <laughs> so that's the solution. That's radical stuff right there. Don't tell me you're radical if you're not willing to do that. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's all right. So that's lawsuits. And then, then we go into this stuff on chapter, the end of chapter six, sexual immorality. Um, I think I had you explore this. So we're back into it again. That was Corinth's issue for sure. And uh, Paul comes back to it and he says this, it, it, two things that appear to be, for sure one of them is a Corinthian proverb. The other one appears to be another one. So food for the stomach and the stomach for food. That was a Corinthian proverb, meaning why would God give me these body parts if not for what they're made for? So they were justifying fornication because, well, why would give me, God give me this stuff for pleasure if not for pleasure? And they were making that argument, like quoting that proverb. You say, yeah, but God's going to destroy them both. Uh, the body is not for immorality. That's not what God gave you those parts for. Your body belongs to the Lord. That's the, so the, what's, what's the heart of sexual morality, of all morality, really, when it comes to anything we do with this body? Or the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's the bottom line. That's what I've imparted to my kids from early on. No part of your being is separate. You don't have a spirit, and that's how you walk with God, and then what you do with your body has nothing to do with it. Um, everything that you do, body, soul, spirit, it all belongs to the Lord. So if you wouldn't do it as an act of worship to the Lord, then don't do it. Don't use your body for that in any way. That's the heart of sexual morality, right? Any, any other things about that? Questions or First insights Peter into that? Paul, uh, I heard it explained that, or do you not know? It's like Paul saying, what? Yeah. Don't you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, have you figured this out yet? You know, get a grip, you people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that word or. In verse 19, um, it shows up. Oh, I should have written it down. I have 13 or 14 times. In the NASB and a couple of other translations, a, free, a sentence will begin with the word or. Mm -hmm. And that's one way of translating this word. Uh, the word is hain. You pronounce it hain. It's this N with a little line over the top. And it's an exclamatory statement. Another way of translating it could be, what? Or, are you stoned? That's how we'd say it today. <laughs> or, what is wrong with you? Are you kidding me? That's what... The, that's what that word literally means as an exclamation. So, like in that case, uh, this is where I think he's quoting another Corinthian saying, every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, right? So in other words, everything but sexual immorality, that hurts other people. But immorality, that doesn't hurt anybody because it's only against my own body, so nobody else is harmed by it. Uh, that's what, what it appears that they're saying. He's like, what? 
Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? Whatever you do, Jesus Christ is doing. Would Jesus Christ go and lay with a prostitute? Are you out of your mind? Put down the pipe. No. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would get that. Okay. Any, any other questions or insight on that? Verse 17 is just, I mean, it's sandwiched in between a negative connotation, but it's mm. so powerful on its own. Yeah. The one who is united and joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. It's like. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's powerful. I mean, as much as, you know, marriage is the two become one flesh, we've become one flesh with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not just spiritually connected with him. He's not a like this mystic out there spirit. We are one with him carnally, too. That's powerful, man. That'll change your life <laughs> and change how you view the members of your body. Awesome. Are there any questions about chapter seven? That was all about marriage and singleness and stuff like that. That often brings questions out. The bottom line question is, do you believe that Paul was saying, giving these things as rules for all time, don't get married and whatnot? Or was he just speaking to a situation in that day and age? I think it's important to realize that some of these things Paul says, I say. Yeah. And other things the Lord says. That's good. And yeah. Know what, what is Paul's idea on this and what, you know, where mm-hmm. it's coming from? But what the Lord says. Yeah. And so separate that out. That's a really good distinction, yeah. Some of it's just good fatherly advice out of concern, and some of it is the Lord gave me some insight into this for you. (laughs) This verse blew me away. I just wrote, (laughs) what? (laughs) (laughs) Which one? (laughs) Verse 13 says, And if any believing woman has an unbelieving husband and he can and he consents to live with her, she must not leave him, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. is he receives the blessings granted through his Christian wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. Mm-hmm. I was like, because they are one flesh. That, yeah. <laughs> yep. And that's what I've encouraged a lot of women and men who live with an unbeliever, and are concerned about how we're going to raise our kids. You know, I mean, outright pagan, unbelieving husbands and wives. The greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You know, you multiplied with your spouse. Christ in you wins every time. If you keep walking with the Lord through this and don't lose heart. Don't believe the lie that, oh man, my kids are going to be wrecked because I have an unbelieving spouse. No, they're not. No, they're not. Your kids are going to receive Christ through you. And eventually your husband, your wife... They're going to come in and have their own walk. But in the meanwhile, your spirit dominates the house. That was a radical statement. That one right there for the first century where women in Greek culture were treated like sex slaves, literally. The law allowed husbands to keep their wife. They wore things similar to a burqa. They weren't allowed. Beautiful women were not allowed to be out in public with their hair out and long. We'll come back to that in chapter 11. Um, They would cover in that culture, so the women, you know, all the whole thing about, you don't want men lusting after women, they would keep them like that and just treated them really like slaves, barefoot and pregnant, like sex slaves in the home. So for Paul to say, in verse 4, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, the wife does. Man, they they could have stoned Paul, crucified him for saying that, because the husband's had it all in. It was like, yeah, baby, I got a wife. I have sex for the rest of my life. And Paul's like, no, you don't. Your wife owns your body, and she could say, I don't want that right now. (laughs) So that was a radical, radical thing for Paul to say that often gets overlooked in here. And even that, what Steve just read, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by his wife. You mean, uh, I thought the husband was the head of the family. No, Christ is the head of the family, and an unbelieving husband is sanctified. So the woman's anointing is what's prevailing in that house right now. If the man's not walking with Jesus, you're not subject to your husband's sin. Christ in you dominates the house. That's powerful. That is revolutionary, radical feminism in the first century. Just wanted to make sure you caught that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right, we don't have time. This is exactly, you know, I timed it out just right. Seven chapters of Corinthians for tonight. So next week, let's just plan on finishing 1 Corinthians. There's a lot of good stuff coming. And the rest of this, 
The following week, we'll cover 2 Corinthians. So I'll just introduce that book next week. So we're going to finish 1 Corinthians next week. Please be ready for that. And then we'll continue on and we'll try to make up the time somewhere along the way. All right. Love you guys. Thanks so much. I love the things you're sharing out of the Word. I can tell it's really coming alive to you as you read. So keep those insights coming. And if you need handouts from prior weeks, uh, let me know. I think 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are up there now. But all the other ones I can print off for anything you're missing. So let me know.